Hello, season's greetings to you, our listeners and market participants, and welcome to KBRA's European podcast. I'm Gordon Kerr, head of European research at KBRA. In our first of what we hope will be a popular podcast on European credit, we will present to you our views on the market for 2022. The market is changing rapidly with the development of COVID-19 and Omicron, but we feel our views will continue to hold true. Today's podcast is a summary of our comments in a recent webinar and our European Structured Finance 2022 Outlook publication, which can be found on kbra.com. In our view, as titled in the report, after what's been a very strong year for European Structured Finance and the markets, broadly speaking, uh, there are challenges developing on the horizon. I am joined today by my colleagues across European Structured Finance, Killian Walsh, who will focus on European ABS. Kali Sirigudi, who will focus on the RMBS world, Stephen Hughes, who will discuss CMBS, and Gabriele Gramazio, who will outline our views on the European structured credit. First of all, as we as mentioned, we see some challenges uh, developing on the horizon. We see a, a roll off of the government pandemic support, which is likely to impact on the collateral performance of various transactions across uh, structured credit. We don't necessarily think this is going to be a dramatic impact, but we do see it as an area of concern as we move from a period where delinquency levels and defaults have been at uh, uh, historically low levels throughout 2021. There is a risk of persistent inflationary pressures. There's been a lot of debate over the past several months about whether or not the current inflationary environment that we find ourselves in is temporary or persistent. Uh, And we would argue that if we head down the route of a more persistent inflationary type of environment, that it could place pressure on on structured finance transactions, both from a performance perspective, as well as uh, as from the reaction from central banks and, and various other bodies. We do see a positive environment for securitization issuance, and this is actually in part on the back of the reaction to the inflationary environment, where we could start to see uh, securitization issuance improve in terms of or ongoing improvement in terms of investor demand as this central bank pulls back and investors are looking for a floating rate product as we migrate into something of a potentially more uh, rising rate environment. What we have seen over the past year, as transactions have have gone through a really troubled time over the past two years, is that uh, ratings have actually been quite stable uh, when you exclude the the troubled aircraft ABS market, which has faced and continues to face uh, many challenges. So uh, overall, we see total issuance falling back, but the investor side of the market uh, picking up and uh, and taking the uh, the baton to in terms of um, uh, carrying the market forward uh, from a European structured finance perspective. So with that backdrop, uh, I thought I'd bring in my colleagues uh, across the European structured finance. And uh, first of all, uh, I'll bring in my uh, my colleague Killian Walsh, who will focus on the European ABS. So, Killian, with that sort of backdrop, presenting a bit of a challenge on the ABS side, I imagine there's a bit of a, a bit of a difference in performance observed based on the various segments uh, across European ABS. Can you give us a quick overview of what you have seen in terms of performance uh, across that ABS spectrum and what your expectations are for the year ahead? I think performance-wise. Across ABS markets, it's been a relatively positive story throughout 2021. In some instances, somewhat surprisingly positive, primarily driven by, as you've mentioned, Gordon, a variety of governmental support measures and various forbearance packages that have been brought in. And in most instances, that has had the desired impact on consumer and indeed small to medium business performance. And I think going forward, as these support measures diminish, we do see an increase in kind of traditional delinquency levels to more normalized pre-pandemic levels. I, I think, and you've already alluded to it, specifically at the consumer level, when we look at kind of the, mar- the, the increase in the marginal propensity to save during the pandemic, it does offer a kind of a natural buffer to any near-term immediate shocks in terms of consumer behavior, which should deliver a relatively resilient performance across consumer sectors throughout 2022. 
SME performance is somewhat more challenged and it is very still very much industry focused, which is what we've seen throughout the pandemic. Certain segments have been hit, the obvious ones, travel, tourism, leisure, entertainment. And even now, as we see a broad swathe of, of further restrictive measures come as the pandemic continues to roll, we, we see further challenges for those specific industries. We also see, I suppose, the challenges across the SME sector of a curtailed uh, and most business sectors of actually a, a curtailed supply chain and the impact that's having on various industries. And that, that is completely different in different industry segments. For example, in trade finance, we see certain supply chain delays causing certain liquidity impacts, whereas a completely different impact on the used car market in the consumer sector, where we see a buoyant used car market because of supply chain and, and new, car, new car price or new, new car sales uh, challenges. So very much across the ABS spectrum, our, our focus very much remains on industry specific and asset class specific issues. But on an overall sense, without being too focused on the, the challenges ahead, we do remain reasonably positive about the outlook across those ABS sectors throughout Europe. All right. Thank you. Based on your conversations and views, do you have any, have you seen any sort of specific trends with regards to the issuance side of things? particularly observed or, or expect in, in 2022? Yeah, I think a couple of points on that. I think where from a European securitization perspective, it's a market that's been beset with regulatory uncertainty for a number of years. There is now at least some certainty on that. There's still certain challenges in relation to that. But I think in terms of STS, et cetera, and all of those other elements, I think there's a lot of certainty there. There is there's certainly some challenges, but I think whereas three, four years ago, we all would have been talking about the regulatory hurdles, that that's certainly been by and large lifted at this point in time. I think clearly, and you alluded to it too in your, in your preamble, is the, the kind of the pulling back or the curtailment of certain ECB and other bond purchase programs. Great. Thank you very much, Killian. Something to look, look forward to. Now, turning our attention to an area of major issuance, European RMBS market, I'm joined by my colleague, Kali. Kali, a lot of people pay attention on the mortgage side to the performance. Uh, and how do you see the RMBS market performance taking shape? In, in yeah, thanks, Gordon. Uh, hello, everyone. The performance of mortgages across Europe and uh, in UK, since the pandemic has been stable, and in fact, uh, improved given the fact that borrowers have we have managed to save money through the pandemic. I think the performance is also supported by the fact that the, 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 the interest rates have remained low. There is a low level of unemployment, as uh, Gordon alluded to, the, the trends in uh, unemployment uh, since the pandemic. The low level of un unemployment, of course, is supported by the government follow schemes and so on. I think this performance is uh, common uh, to the uh, both, both the owner-occupied and vital aid sectors. Of course, the exception uh, to that performance uh, could be the uh, season pre-2008 originations in the non-conforming sector. And uh, but then uh, such performance in recent times has improved only on account of the fact that uh, services and lenders have provided alternative uh, repayment arrangements to some of these borrowers who have not been able to come back to normal monthly prepayments uh, after having enjoyed uh, payment holidays. Property valuations across Europe have improved in most countries, uh, which is positive for the expected loss on RMBS transactions. Uh, for example, the, on an average, 7.1% uh, house price appreciation has been observed for European jurisdictions, 8.6% year-on-year uh, in UK. And then going forward, the house price growth will likely uh, be limited, of course, given uh, that you know, there will be constraints on affordability and deposits by borrowers, uh, purchasers of uh, properties, uh, potential right in interest rates. And in contrast to the above pressures on demand, the lack of housing supply will continue to affect uh, uh, or support the current levels of house prices. Thank you very much. So I think one one aspect that that I guess has been uh, perplexing in terms of in terms of the RMBS market has been how much prime RMBS has been missing over the past several years, but it really hasn't stopped the market issuance. We've seen steady issuance of buy to let, of, of uh, non-performing, uh, and even re-performing over the last couple of years. 
Um, how do you see this developing into uh, into 2022? Yeah, thanks, Gordon. So, of course, the issuance landscape in 2021 uh, has been interesting, uh, albeit a large part of prime RMBS issuance has been absent, given the support by the central banks across Europe and uh, UK. But then the market, the securitization market has clearly shrugged off the constraints uh, thrown up by the pandemic. Now, of course, just to repeat some of the aspects which you have uh, already pointed out, there have been growth in the issuance backed by bipolar mortgages with several in the UK, a few in the Netherlands. We saw refinancing of a few season UK non-confirming transactions, adding to the volume of issuance this year and several in the Irish re-performing in space. The non-performing loan issuances have grown in 2021 after a brief lull in 2020. And there has been, of course, there have been some issuance in the prime mortgage space as well as those backed by new originations in the UK non-confirming sector. So, so and, and, and lastly, I think KBRA has been part of some of the activity in the synthetic risk transfer space, as well as the revival of the issuances backed by equity release mortgages, and this revival uh, since the global financial crisis. So going forward, you know, we do not expect that the markets, these markets will diminish, but then the volumes of issuance may uh, actually reduce from the current year levels. And, 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 and of course, the prime RMBS space is expected to revive as a consequence of the central bank's uh, pullback from refinancing activities. We also expect that there will be mortgage products for lending in retirement, which will see further growth across European jurisdictions, which will also likely result in a higher issuance in this space. The recent activity in the non-performing, the re-performing mortgage portfolios in Ireland, Spain, uh, Italy, and Portugal indicate to potential securitizations in 2022 and beyond. And we, we also observe an appetite in the European jurisdictions to replicate the phenomenon of re-performance of non-performing loans like that observed in Ireland. So that could ra give rise to potential transactions in the re-performing space across uh, European jurisdictions, particularly where you have concentrations of non-performing loan. Lastly, the activity in the green mortgage space is likely to grow, uh, where mortgage products link in the energy efficiency of a property, uh, particularly what you see currently in Netherlands. And in recent months, uh, there has been some effort to create track record in the green mortgage space in UK as well. I think, Gordon, that's broadly KBRA's expectation for RMBS in 2022. Great. Thank you very much, Kelly. That was, uh, was excellent. Now, uh, moving on to a, a, a space that was, well, it was expected to be a lot more troubled, I think, than it, than it ended up being, and that's a, in the commercial mortgage space. And joining me is my colleague, Stephen Hughes. Stephen, CMBS issuance in, in 2021 was, was actually surprisingly strong, given the uh, COVID impact to, to commercial real estate. Uh, you ended up with deals backed by a, a, a varying range of asset types. Do you, do you expect this to continue into 2022? Can it continue? Yeah, it was uh, surprisingly strong, I think, uh, especially given the subdued um, uh, nature of the, the sector in 2020. I mean, I think there have been 17 deals so far this year. We've rated nine of them. Um, at the start of the year, I'd have expected to see certain deal types um, backed by industrial logistics or, or, or long income that, that might come out in this year. But we've seen we've seen retail warehouse, affordable rent, cold storage, mental service areas, student housing. CRE CLO. I think if you looked hard enough, you can spot a hotel in, uh, in one of the tourist deals there. Well, that was a refinancing of the square. I think going forward, in COVID strains notwithstanding, it should be easier to get certain types of deals away this year um, or next year. Um, I would have thought student housing would be one, which should, which kind of looks stronger in paper um, at, the, at the start of this kind of academic year. Other ones I'm, I'm guessing being strong offices should also perform well. Things that might take a, a little longer would be probably operational assets. Uh, I don't think still are there yet. Leisure assets, um, business hotels. Also, occupancy rates have been, uh, are still quite subdued. Retail is still hit, I think, um, especially shopping centers uh, with what's going on in e-commerce. And then there's still this kind of great unknown with, with um, us, especially kind of secondary office portfolios about what's going to happen with that. Great. I think one of the... One of the areas of uh, of uncertainty has been uh, around, as we experience ourselves, surrounding the performance of office loans, uh, with lots of people still working from home or partially working from home. 
how do you think they will perform in in that uh, sort of short to medium term? <laughs> Essentially mixed. The data that we see from firms such as in DBREs and Cushman Wakefields, this is kind of heavily skewed towards the prime end of the market. So we're seeing prime yields and prime rents still at their headline level, still performing very well. What we are seeing is vacancy rates um, start to creep up. And that is obviously because of companies have different, different you know, flexible work policies. We're going to see a lot of this happen, I think. It's going to be a bit of a slow burn over the next three to four years as leases start to expire. It's very difficult at the moment, I think, for companies to make space and real estate decisions, especially you know, long-term ones, given what's going on and the changing nature of, of office work. So there is a bit of a there is a bit of a change between those companies that have gone full time back five days a week to the office and other ones that you know the office offices have become completely discretionary um, and a lot of people aren't demanding that that staff come back at all. I still would maintain that I think strong offices in well located areas with you know modern all the you know the, the excellent green badges with lots of kind of local amenities around them will still perform very well. My concern would be more for secondary business parks um, with just a lack of amenities there. And I think if you were to ask the workers working in those places, given the option, would you choose to work from home or stay in the office? I think actually you know, you'll be surprised that a lot of them would actually prefer to work from home. So that's where I can see things. Uh, that's where I can see things performing quite badly. Interesting. So I think one area of that generated a lot of uh, interest and buzz uh, in this past uh, past year is that we saw the first CRE CLO in Europe, or sorry, first publicly distributed CRE CLO in Europe since the uh, global financial crisis, rated by KBRA, rated by you, uh, I guess, the Stars deal. Do we do we expect this sector to open up now in Europe uh, like it has done in the US? Potentially. You know, we, we did rate the first, we did rate stars. Um, we are quite active in the CRE CLO space within, within the US. And, you know, in the US, there tends to be a bit more granularity. I think usually there are you know, 15 to 20 loans backing these and it's all sequential pay down. There's also, it's a more mature market. So they've kind of gone one step further forward. They have a lot more managed deals where this one was quite a static deal there. So there could be a lot more flexibility to come going forward. But regardless, I mean, the loans, the loans backing these CRE CLOs tend to be a lot more transitional. Um, they're typically um, they're typically a bit riskier, you know, non-stabilized, high leverage, non-operating assets. You know, we're certainly seeing a lot of inquiries regarding this the space here. I think a lot will depend on investor appetite. Um, you know, from our perspective, they they take a lot longer to um, to actually underwrite to actually analyze them. It'll be interesting to see how much the investor base really embraces them. But I think they do. If they do, I think we'll certainly see a lot more issuance in that sector during 2022. Very good. Thank you very much, Stephen. And to a perfect transition on the CLO space, we're now going to migrate across and, and uh, talk to a colleague, uh, Gabriella Gramazio. And Gabriella, I think one of the the uh, broadly syndicated loan CLOs has been one of the hottest markets in in uh, the European uh, European structured finance. Part of that was this sort of reset and refinancing that is uh, that was uh, really saw things fly through the roof. But excluding that, it was still a uh, even you know excluding that it was still a strong year. And given the fact we put our outlook out uh, only uh, whatever two weeks ago um, or a week ago, it's sorry. probably already uh, outdated. <laughs> The issuance number there is already outdated. So, what what has been the sort of development in the in the last few months with regards to the CLO uh, CLO issuance? Yeah, uh, thanks, Gordon, and and good afternoon to everyone. This has been, let me say, an incredible year for CLO uh, for two reasons. One has been a very strong performance. So we have seen a very low level of defaults in the underlying leverage loan market. So we do expect these to increase for next year but still from a very low level and still well below the historical average. And the other great story for CLO uh, from this year is clearly been the issuance, which has been uh, incredibly high. And just to give you a bit of context, so we start in September when they opened the gate 
and uh, we get back to attending conferences and we talk to market participants. And the market participants, in particular, you know, the arrangers, the portfolio managers, they tell us that there are like 50 to 80 warehouses active. And that it's, oh. it's clearly a very high number. So we get to the month of October that has been a milestone. Why? Because basically we broke the record for new issuance, and I'm referring exclusively to the new issuance at the moment. That was in 2019, that was the, the record post the great financial crisis of 29.8 billion. And we haven't finished that because then we go to November and we had like another record month of 6.3 billion or 15 new issuances. So we bring the total to 37.3 billion. And that's that our look, our outlook all of a sudden becomes outdated. So uh, looking at the pace of issuance of the last few months, uh, we're probably going to see something above the third, between 38 and 39 billion, again, just as new issuance. This is going to be the new high water mark for the European market. So that's only your expectation for the end of this year. <laughs> what, uh, what, uh, what are you expecting for, for next year? Can we repeat this? Uh, I certainly think at least in terms of the reset and refinancing that uh, that cannot uh, continue at that pace in uh, in 2022. So it's clearly very difficult to make prediction now in the silo market because it turned out that we always get wrong somehow. But let me say this. The CLO issuance will remain strong through uh, 2022, although likely off the eyes that we have seen in 2021, so the, the issuance really depend on market dynamics. Uh, what we think is that there's going to be a reversal toward the five year mean of Euro 25 billion. So we would assume because the loan supply remains robust and the demand for Euro paper will be elevated considering the LIBOR transition in the US market. Very good. So, what, uh, in terms of the, I, I guess, uh, a little bit more on the uh, underlying collateral and the performance expectations, what are you, what are you expecting in terms of positives and negatives for the for the year ahead? Yeah, absolutely. So, we already mentioned the fact that uh, we do expect to navigate next year through a very benign uh, credit environment. Of course, now there are some downsides, as you mentioned, as opening remarks to this webinar uh, about uh, you know new variants affecting uh, the general economy. But let me say this, um, speaking you know, recently with portfolio managers, with arrangers, uh, the pipeline for uh, European leveraged loan market looks buoyant. It's quite strong already going into uh, the beginning of the next year. So the high volumes are driven by activity in uh, M&A, uh, leveraged buyout, we're going to see uh, some refinancing uh, uh, of debt of uh, non-investment grade corporate, uh, but also dividend recap. So there's going to be a lot of supply coming to the market. So the new issuance is there to benefit from this. And then on the demand side, what we're going to see, well, as I mentioned already, probably we're going to see an expanding investor base. So potentially, you know, the Japanese and US, investing, US investors might increase their allocation to European CLO. What are the, the main drivers behind these? Well, usually for, you know, Japanese investors, it might be a matter of currency rate, swap rate. If these are favorable, they can come and join back the European market. So Japanese investors always been present in the European market, but lately their role has been less relevant in the past. We have seen like one large bank that essentially was like one of the great anchor investors for all the AAA CLO that were sort of placed in Europe. And then for US investors, you know, the, you also have to consider the relative value of this asset class uh, compared to the US. There is, uh, of course, the benefit of the floor. So for the people that are not too familiar with the CLO as an asset class, you have to think that uh, while all the notes are linked to Uriba, there is a floor of 0%, meaning that effectively you get an extra boost of 50 pips on your return. So this is particularly attractive. But this benefit of the Uribe uh, might diminish over time if there is a steepening of uh, uh, the forward uh, uh, Uribe curve. So these are pretty much the dynamics that will um, determine the, the demand of uh, uh, CLO notes uh, coming in into next year. And of course, as you mentioned already, 
central bank's activity will dictate uh, you know the amount of liquidity in the system and this will have an impact uh, also on the spreads on the liability notes and one thing to keep in mind with CLO it's always the arbitrage so it's the difference between uh, what is your weighted average cost of funding through the liabilities and uh, uh, what is the spread that your assets are paying in the underlying collateral if let's say uh, for any reason a reduction of the liquidity in the system will cause some of this liability to widen faster than uh, the spread that is paying by your underlying collateral that could uh, uh, reduce the amount of uh, new issuance in particular, it might have an impact on uh, the refinance and reset activity for the next year. So, in summary, we see the market in a cautiously positive light. Inflation and its impact will be key to the development of the market, both from a collateral and an issuance perspective, as investors become a bigger part of the picture. Excluding the aircraft ABS, ratings have been stable over the pandemic period, and we expect will continue to be in 2022. And lastly, ESG will continue to be a focus for the markets, but we may still need to be patient for it to become mainstream in ABS. Thank you very much for listening. We look forward to bringing you more conversations in European credit in 2022. Don't forget to check kbra.com for our latest rating reports and research. Stay safe and speak to you again in the new year. Thank you.